Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel. And thank you so much for stopping by. This is a channel that is dedicated to the wonderful world of wine. And I help all of those of you enjoying wine and studying wine alike to understand the topic better so you get more from it. In this series, we look at something called explaining wine terminology. So there may be certain topics and phrases and words that are commonly used in the world of wine. And I want to put some background and some understanding behind those topics. In this one, we are looking at cork taint or corked. Sometimes you may hear somebody say this wine is corked. Uh, we call this cork taint in the wine trade uh, or corked wine. OK, now these this is part of the world of what we call wine faults, but we could say they're wine faults and taints. And that's because it's quite a complex area. It's complex because it covers wine chemistry through to microbiology and also to personal opinions and judgments and perceptions of wines. One person's wine fault may not be another's. Uh, person's wine fault. So it's important to understand those differences as well. Now, just a couple of definitions before we kick into what exactly cork taint or corked wine is about. And then we'll go into all the ways that the wine industry is adapting around this problem. First of all, though, what is a fault? OK, so a fault is, a, is what is actually derived from wine making, how the wine is produced, such as things like volatile acidities, oxidation, brettanomyces, and also reduction. Uh, a wine taint is something that's come from outside of the wine making process, such as cork taint uh, or trichlorine anisole, which we're about to look at very, very shortly. So it would be a good idea to actually understand the differences between faults and taints, because many people get those merge kind of crossed over in their understanding of wine. Now, um, if any of you out there do have any comments, concerns or questions, please do put them in the comments section below this video. Uh, also, you'll find there a subscribe button and also a like button. Make sure you click both of, both of those. Um, otherwise, uh, you can get in touch with me here at Wine with Jimmy via the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. So what is cork taint? It is very difficult to, <laughs> to show a diagram or a picture of exactly what cork taint is. Um, but what I've got in the background there are some corks. They look like they're being chemically assessed or at least in the preparation of that, as you can see. Now, what is cork taint? Now, here you have something at the bottom called 2,4,6-trichlorinanosol, or otherwise known in the trade as TCA. Now, this is the major compound. There are others, but this is the major compound responsible for the musty taint that you may find in wines when it is affected by cork taint. Now, this is formed in cork bark by reactions of phenolic compounds and chlorine. Chlorine is important to understand here because most of the world's cork plantations are found within southern Portugal and other parts of Iberia, some in Sicily and Sardinia, but most of it is in Portugal. Now, the major source of environmental chlorines in the cork oak forests found in southern Portugal, for example, are these organochlorine insecticides, which were used very abundantly in the 1950s through to the 1980s. So a real huge use of these abundant chlorine, uh, organochlorine insecticides. And of course, this become has become very much leached into the environment there. And it will be a part of that environment for many, many, many years to come. So that's what can, of course, uh, react with the phenolic compounds within cork bark, uh, bark creating these uh, very 
uh, musty compounds in the cork, for example. So what we're learning here is it's in fact the cork bark and then the corks that are produced from that which are going to be affected by cork taint and that in turn will affect the wine that touches that cork uh, when it is in bottle, of course. Uh, now, how do we detect cork taint? Now, this is, of course, quite important. Absolutely no, uh, no um, um, really um, problem that you at home have experienced a corked wine before. It may be that somebody in your group in a restaurant or at a wine tasting or maybe at home, maybe you have experienced something which just doesn't smell right and it has this very sort of musty characteristic to it. So this is what we would call is cork taint and it can be absolutely devastating certainly if you have been to a very special place and that special place uh, that you've visited you've bought a couple of bottles of wine and you go okay i'm going to try these 10 years down the line 20 years down the line i'm going to open them up for my child's 21st or something like that and of course you open it up and it's corked now that is horrible because you that actually was corked in the moment you bought that wine and you've been holding on for it for so long. Sadly, sometimes that's the risk that we run, the gauntlet that we run sometimes with this. But you will be able to get these wines replaced wherever you purchase a corked wine from. You should return it and they will replace the bottle for you. Harder for the very older wines, but you'll need to get in contact with the person that you purchased it from. Um, now, it's uh, it's a smell. So it's something that we cannot see. So cork taint is not something we see in the glass. It's not bits of cork that are floating in top of the wine. That is just a diminished cork. OK, so it's not a sight, but it is a smell. And that's really the first indication that we have that there's something wrong with a corked wine. So it's musty smelling. OK, so a wine should smell pretty fresh. A lot of wines do. But if you imagine you might have a very unattractive, mouldy, damp, wet cardboard smell, then something, of course, is very wrong. Now, please don't shoot me the messenger. But as a teacher of wine of thousands of thousands of students, I have had many, many interesting comments about what it reminds the student of. And one of those is, um, and please don't, this is not what I'm saying, but uh, it's what the students have said. They said it smells like a, a charity shop or sometimes smells like an army surplus store. And I think what they're getting at here is that it's that kind of old or damp or sort of fusty smell that you might get, but please, I apologize to all those charity shop owners out there and army surplus store owners and so on. Um, now, the other thing that does is that it can diminish the primary aromas and can completely overpower the wine. So all you really smell is this damp cardboard, wet, moldy smell. Uh, it can shorten the length of wines because it dominates them. Uh, and it's, uh, as mentioned, usually from micro, uh, microbial, uh, microbial rather contamination of the cork, and it's always going to be a problem. So when there is a corked wine, it's not a case of somebody saying, oh, yeah, 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 that's actually fine. You know, it will always be an issue. Now, some of us are more skilled or more sensitive, perhaps, at to actually picking up cork taint. Um, some of us don't pick it up as much, and sometimes cork tank can be very, very minor, so small that only a few people may pick it up. But it still will need to be uh, replaced, that bottle. It does diminish those primary aromas of the wine. OK, so that is uh, how it is detected. So, of course, this is a problem. If you think about a product that has been made, the wine, and it goes to market, and then a bottling process, the closure, is actually causing it to be spoiled, then of course this is a major problem. So we have had options here, as you can see, of reducing cork taint by the cork industry. Of course, dominated the world of closures of wine bottles for many, many years until recently, and we'll get to that later. But of course, the cork industry has had to really adapt to the 
uh, the real criticism that they have had for the problems of cork closures. And they have adapted by, uh, as you'll see here, much more rigorous quality control during the cork production, including very high cost, high tech solutions such as gas chromatography. Uh, and that's to check for the presence of trichloranosyl TCA, the chemical compound that produces that corked taint. So much more um, quality control as one would expect from the industry that has the problem. Also, um, cleaning corks with steam extraction, which has been something championed by Amorin. Um, now, this is where you have um, really a, 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 a sort of a technical principle uh, where it's been sort of innovated by Amorin, but others as well. And it's kind of linked to steam distillation. Uh, and that's really for volatile extraction from the solids. Uh, so steam extraction is one way uh, of reducing cork taint. Another one is by the production of technical corks. So this is creating closures from recomposed cork particles that have been cleaned and reconstituted with other materials such as plastic. The result is a closure that looks and behaves like a natural cork, um, but of course it, it, it is different. It's uh, often much safer. Diam, as you see in this picture, is the, the real champions of this technical cork. Um, then we've got something which we have corks with an impermeable cork membrane. This is a relatively inexpensive solution by introducing a barrier between the cork and the wine. And here is the barrier. Now, it's not that big in comparison to the cork. It's showing you layers. They've expanded out layers here, which will be found on top of the cork. This is championed by Pro Cork. Uh, and this impermeable membrane between the cork and wine is the one that gives a wrinkled appearance on the end of the cork and excludes any aromas uh, reaching the wine from the cork. OK, so impermeable cork membranes are being used as well. But of course, we have um, the development outside of the cork industry. So this is, in fact, reducing cork taint by alternative industries. And you will see these very commonly. So we just talked about technical corks. So these are uh, corks that have been subjected to a manufacturing process often with reconstituted cork and the use of plastic as well. Synthetic closures, or otherwise known as plastic corks, these are uh, made of food grade plastic with a silicone coating. Uh, they are quite cheap, quite abundant, but they're not brilliant for the environment. And also they are not great at uh, protecting the wine from oxygen. So they're only actually used for very mass production and early consumption wine styles. Screw caps, of course, are the big one. Please do look at my video on screw caps also found here on the YouTube channel, uh, which will give you a real good background on the use of screw caps and the positive role that they can play in the world of wine. And then glass stoppers as well, often referred to by the major brand, Vinalock. Uh, and these are glass drop stoppers that are uh, made from glass, but the actual seal, seal of it that hits the bottle is actually a plastic ring, a seal. Uh, but uh, these are something which are used, I think, more in continental Europe. I see them in Germany, Austria, for example. OK, so that is really the world of cork taint. Now, if you do, like I mentioned earlier, if you do come across a wine which is corked um, and you now have the understanding of what it is and what it smells like, um, you can then confidently say to the person that you purchased it that the wine is corked. It takes a bit of, I suppose, confidence building to do this. But if it is in a restaurant, they have the, um, the obligation really to replace that bottle. And to be honest, even if there's nothing in their eyes wrong with it, uh, but it's your as your decision to make. So please do send them back in restaurants if there is an issue or uh, also in shops. If you taste something at home and you think it's not right, of course, don't tip it away. Um, don't drink it all because it will be horrible, um, but leave it in the bottle, maybe half of the bottle, three quarters of the bottle, depends how much you've already poured out, but take it back and get them to taste it, but they will have to replace the bottle. 
Okay, so replacing the bottle, always take it back to the source and always keep your receipt, of course, when you purchase these wines. Okay, so um, that is the world of cork taint. Now, um, as you know, I am Wine with Jimmy. Your next steps, if you are interested in learning much more about wine, of course, would be to immerse yourself within this channel here on YouTube with the free content. But there is an amazing world out there of more content, exclusive content. And this can be found, as you can see by the slide, at www.winewithjimmy.com. Click on the button E Learning Wine. It'll take you to this and you can select on any of these levels uh, if you are studying WSET, for example. But there are other um, areas there that you can take as well. But uh, do have a look at those, certainly if you are a professional uh, student learning the world of wine. Uh, you'll find within there, certainly if you are a student, over 100 videos for the level three certificate. Um, there are multiple choice questions, flashcards, short written questions, mock examinations, revision sessions. Uh, there's a lot of content there for WSET's level one, two and three and four as well. Thank you so much for your time. As ever, please, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch by commenting on this video below. And remember, click like and subscribe. Social media can be found at the bottom of every slide. And if you do find yourself in wonderful London town, then please come and see me. You know I have schools and a bar, so come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Bye.